How's everyone doing? Great. Anyone learn anything today? A lot. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, let's give a hand to all the speakers and to Alan and Steve for all the time. So I'm going to talk today how to create protected multiplier wealth in any market and any economy. So uh, as Alan mentioned, just a little bit about myself. I'm the creator and host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. Uh, it's a top-rated uh, business and investing podcast. We've been downloaded. I think that number's up a little bit, cl close to 3 million downloads. We're in over 180 countries. And what we basically talk about on the show is cash flow, everything cash flow. How to create cash flow from real estate, how to create cash flow from commodities, businesses. We cover crypto and blockchain assets. Um, and we also cover, of course, paper assets. And then, um, as I'll mention, I'm the president, chief wealth and investment strategist at Producers Wealth, where we help entrepreneurs uh, and business owners create, protect, and multiply their wealth uh, in any economy. So just a little bit about the show. It started as a passion project, really. Um, the first microphone I bought was like a $25 headset. Uh, I never knew what it was going to basically turn into, but I've been very privileged to interview guys such as uh, Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author from which they poor dad. Anyone else had a Purple Book moment in here? Read the book? Sorry, my accent again. Purple Book moment. So, <laughs> I live in Newtown, Pennsylvania, across the river with my beautiful wife, Megan, and our kids, Christian and Josephine, but it's not a Pennsylvanian accent. So, <laughs> originally from South Africa, I came here in uh, 2001 uh, with a backpack, uh, another duffel bag, a sense of humor, and I guess a sense of adventure. I uh, had uh, Ron Cardone on, Jim, and Jim Rogers, I was honored to interview uh, Dr. Ron Paul, presidential candidate. Uh, Kevin Hampton from the Shark Tank, any Shark Tank fans? Okay. And Russell Brunson, which I, everyone is probably starting to realize who he is, his company is ClickFunnels, it's one of the fastest growing uh, SAAS companies um, without any uh, venture capital funding. Anybody read this book? Familiar with this book? The one thing, right? The core idea, and usually it's just the core idea positioned in a certain way. Look at Al, Al Rod, right? Al, fantastic guy, you know, changed my life, but inspired people by telling them to wake up early, right? Great book. Um, this is the same thing, the one thing, the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results. So I'm going to start talking today about. Also the one thing, the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary financial results. So when you talk about money and financial results and so forth, a lot of people will say, you know, especially when there's very wealthy folks or billionaires or folks in private, uh, private family offices, like, what's that one thing? You know, <laughs> what are they doing differently than what everyone else is doing? So I figured you can start with why do people fight financially, right? So I always try to re, uh, reverse engineer things when I'm trying to solve a problem. Um, and I mean, some of the things that I, just comes to mind, why people struggle, is the mindset and worldview, right? They don't have a growth mindset and they have a scarcity of, of, of worldview. So there's not enough in the world, you know, so they try to hold on to everything. Financial literacy and education is obviously a big thing because we don't learn anything in schools about money, besides giving it to banks and Wall Street, right? Um, wrong data and information, and that's a huge thing because even though we are aware that we don't learn anything about money in school really, um, we then seek out data and information, and most of the data and information that's out there is really uh, the complete opposite of what the wealthy is doing. So we have the wrong data and information, we have wrong role models, mentors, coaches, and advisors. That happens. You know, someone that's not aligned with the core beliefs, the worldview, the mindset that you have, and they don't really know where you want to go, right? What your goals are. So, and then, of course, you know, not taking action, that's obviously a big one. But what if you do all these things, right? What if you do all these things and you're still struggling in a certain way and still not getting to where you want to go? I would say that one big thing is that there's no strategy. And I think this is one of the things that I see most, and, and, and we have um, 
with clients in over 45 states, we've consulted with many, many different folks, and these are successful people that have the right mindset, they have the right, the right worldview, they take action, all the other things that I just said, but there's no strategy, there's no blueprint that they can lay out. So, strategy. Usually when I say, people would say, well, I think I have a strategy. My response would be, is markets go up, down, and sideways. They just do three things. Uh, that I'm aware of. If they do anything else, let me know. But they go up, down, and sideways. So do you have a strategy that's going to help you get to your goals in all three of these markets? And if you don't, then you have to sit back and re basically just look at it and say, well, i, I got to reevaluate my strategy. My strategy is a little bit different. So what is a strategy? Because that's another, another thing that, I, that I've really learned from very successful people. Um, and I'm a professional note taker when I interview these cash flow ninjas on my show, is they're very, very big on definitions of words because stuff gets thrown around. So all over the place, savings, investing, speculating, people think that they're saving, but they're technically investing, but they're actually speculating. So let's, let's nail down what's the definition. So in the business dictionary it says, a strategy is a method or plan chosen to bring about a desired future such as an achievement of a goal or a solution to a problem. The art and science of planning and marshalling resources for their most efficient, which is a very powerful word, and effective use. The term is derived from the Greek word for generalship and or leading an army. So what does a strategy mean in that context um, of what we just looked at the, in the business dictionary? So for me, it's why and what and how you do and what you do. You know, uh, I'm very um, privileged to be part of the strategic coach uh, coaching program, and Dan Sullivan talks about constantly, you've got to think about your thinking. <laughs> Sit down and think about your thinking. And I'm also a big part of it is what you own and why you own it. That alone, just that sentence right there, will separate you from 90% of the people out there. They don't know what they own, and they don't know why they own it. And then, of course, how does what you own and what you do, and how you do it, get you closer to your objective, objectives, your goals, and your vision? So that's kind of when I think strategy, when you develop a strategy that's holistic, that includes everything, not just different pieces, which I'll get to in a second from a, from a mind, mindset perspective. This is kind of what I look at when I look at strategy. Any golfers in the room? Any golf enthusiasts? Okay, I'm originally from South Africa. We used to have a couple of good golfers. One of my favorite golf golfers is Ernie Els. By the way, I'm a hor horrible golfer, but I love watching golf. And the one thing about Ernie, if you're not familiar with Ernie, he's a two-time US Open champion. He's won the British Open twice too, or the Open as they call it over there. And the big, the big thing about Ernie is they call them the Big Easy. So why did they call Ernie the Big Easy? Because of his swing, his nice and easy swing. So for me, a strategy is the swing. It's the picking up the club and swinging the club. That, that, and that's the focus of very wealthy and successful individuals and folks that I've been honored to interview. Where the majority of people focus is the golf clubs, the product. So you look at families in, in family offices or very successful folks, their focus lies in the big picture, the overall strategy. What, I'm tr what am I trying to accomplish? What's my goals? How do I get there? Let's break it down and let's eventually execute on it and get there. Where, and this is, this is by design, we're marketed to in products, 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 products. You look at any commercial, you turn on any TV, you look at, go onto any website. So it's very, very product focused where the big holistic picture is more about the strategy than just the product itself. So there's a golf, there's a couple of golf, uh, golf clubs in a golf bag the last time I checked. They use them all over the, the, the course, but the swing stays the same. The strategy, overall strategy stays the same. And I know we're not going to get too technical. You do have a different swing when you have a putter than a driver. I get it. But bear with me for one second. Uh, anybody seen this before? You got the cash flow quadrant. Um, this is what one of the, the best books, actually. I think this is probably Kiyosaki's best book for me. 
And I always turn back to this. When you look at strategy, this picture right here really describes the world that we live in better than anything else that I've actually seen. So when you're trying to figure out different ways that people are doing different things, this really sums it up for me. So you obviously have the employee, you have the self-employee, the business owner, and the investor. Everyone starts basically in the E quadrant. They go into different quadrants. There's many different ways of doing it. Um, we've worked with folks that they are very successful in the E quadrant. Right? As doctors and lawyers and so forth. But what do they do to get over to the B and the I? It's part of their overall strategy, which I'll get into the big picture. But the, ca the cash creation for them is their job. They love it. They're surgeons. They love doing it. And people are, they we have different passions, right? Drive different cars, wear different clothes, <laughs> speak differently, all that kind of stuff. So everyone has got a different passion. But to play the game of money, you can be in the E quarter or in the S quarter and at the B simultaneously when you, you position and reposition your, your assets and capital more efficiently. So what are the strategies, the employee strategy? You know, education, they go to high school, high school, college, universities, post-grad, they work for a company, an employer, they're trading time for money, they invest their resources, their time, their unique ability, skill set, in the company. Nothing wrong with it. Again, it's just the different places in the world. And they invest money in other companies through qualified plans, right? So they take money that they earn uh, by pouring their resources into the company, and then the money that they earn, what's left over, they actually put into other people's companies. One of the highest tax brackets, there's really no leverage, and there's no control. What about the self employee strategy, right? The S, very hardworking folks, very successful folks, again. Uh, education, high school, college, universities, postgrad, continuing education for S's to be successful, they have to invest in continuing education, lifelong learning, books, podcasts, courses, seminars, mastermind. They still own a job, so they're still trading time for money, but they invest their resources into their own company, right? So they invest it in themselves, their, their time, their unique ability. And this is one of the the big things that are holding S's and S quadrants is the money that they make generating uh, or generating that in their business, they take that and invest in other, someone else's company too. Which is, that's why they're stuck in the S and they don't cross over to the B or the I, right? Which is one of the big, big factors. One of the biggest things that we see that hold business owners back, and by the way, every single person here is a business owner, you are a business. As Jay-Z would say, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. So all of us, we're, we're individual businesses, right? So the biggest mistake that sometimes business owners, we do make by not growing our own business is the money that we generate through our unique, unique ability and our value that we deliver to the world. What do we do with it? Instead of investing it in our business, we're investing it in someone else's business. And I'll get to where there is a great crossover for that and time to do that. Um, still not a lot of leverage, still not a lot of control. The business owner strategy, education, you know, whether it be high school, colleges, university, postgrad, still lifelong learning, books, podcasts, courses, seminars, masterminds, mentors, coaches. And they, they, they also they have a very strong team around them too. They own a self-managing company and they own a system that produces, right? There's a system that they have. They invest their resources back into their own company. And where do they put their money? They put it back in their own company and in their, um, in their own investments, right? So, and they invest in themselves, obviously. One of the most more tax favorable than the other two, the right side, obviously, and a lot of control and leverage. So that's the big difference sometimes where S's are stuck and then they don't cross over to the B because the money, they create that machine uh, and all of a sudden they give it to someone that, you know, that they don't have control over it, like, like, like I said earlier, and they can't really go back <laughs> and grow that more, bring on employees and expand and grow their business. The investor strategy, this is, uh, by the way, just like I mentioned, very high income earners that, that are ease, they love it, they're passionate about their work, they can cross into it as an I, right, as an investor. So same, same education, they have freedom of time, relationships, <coughs> purpose, and money, because they're investing for cash flow. They invest in a system where their money is working for them. Hands off money working for them. 
So if you're flipping houses or wholesaling, you're still an E. You're not an I, right? Because it's not in a system that is generating money for you. Money's just working for you. You still have to use your unique ability and your touches and your efforts, your time, your resources to create that. And they invest, again, into themselves, their own investments, other passive investments. This is the most favorable tax bracket and the one with the most control and the most leverage. So one thing about the financial media too, and this is the casino, I would say 98% of most of the advice that we're getting is the complete opposite of what actually the folks, the corporations that part of it are doing themselves. And I get to uh, what they're doing in a second. But I would say, yeah, 97 to 98% of this. And these guys, their goal is to lure you back into that casino. You know, there's bottle service at, at this restaurant at this table, come on in. Free room, room upgrade, right? We'll give you a couple extra bucks. They need to get you back into the casino. So people would then say, okay, you see, then what is what is the best investments? Because that's the number one question that people usually ask, right? Um, at a water cooler or at a coffee shop or wherever folks are, you know, over here people talk about money and it's, you know, this is a good mutual fund or this is a good ETF or what's a good investment these days and so forth. So our philosophy and what we teach is this is your this is the best investments and this is the number through which you should be investing at all times. Your number one and greatest investment is yourself because you are the asset. <laughs> That's it. You're the asset. So when somebody says, I have $10,000, what should I do with my money? You should be growing that asset. You should be pouring that money into the asset and develop that asset through getting a high income skill set, increasing your value to the world, learn something different. So that will be your best return. The $10,000 that that person had that asked that question, that would be their greatest return or not. Relationships, right? No man or woman is an island. So we need people to help us accomplish our goals. And we're, we're back animals, yeah? We're, we're a strange species, our humans, us humans. And then of course, number three, as I mentioned, business. Investing as yourself as a business or your business or your real estate business that you have already because that's always going to be your, your best return. And at some stage or level, you're starting to take money away from your business because you have a machine running now, and you're putting that into passive income uh, investments, whether this is investors through syndications that you do yourself or with other folks that are ninjas in their space. We prefer the model to partner with folks that are crushing it in their particular niche and not just doing everything ourselves, right? Focus, stay in our lane, grow our business, keep, our, keep the money machine going, and then the capital, then find qualified folks that will help you develop and grow that money. So, because we're all in the business of multiplying capital. This is just a quick formula that I learned from a mentor of mine that completely changed my life that I share because it was so powerful. It's your mental capital times your relationship capital will always get your financial capital. So breaking that down, we're, and, and the, the, I would say the, the investment ladder, as I call it, of where we're investing. So developing yourself, your mental capital, I have $10,000, what do I invest in? Boom, there you go. What do you listen to? Your podcast, books, courses, seminars, all that. Develop that. Because if you de develop that, and you develop at the same time your relationship capital, you go to events such as this, you can meet like-minded folks, you go to meetups and so forth. Before you know it, the other, the rest of the other one will take care of itself. I think a lot of folks focus at the end and neglect the first two, and uh, then they wonder why, they, you know, what are they doing wrong? What, what is the thing that they're doing wrong? So the strategy for any economy, as I mentioned, so what, what is part of a strategy that we have to have in place that could weather ups, downs, and sideways, right? Because there's market cycles, there's asset cycles. How do we build something? How do we position ourselves? Well, the first thing is you have to have control, right? And you have to determine what level of control you want. So if something goes sideways or south, or however you want to put it, how much control do you have um, over that asset that, that, that's going down, or that deal, or that business, and so forth? Alignment with unique ability. This is also, this, this is this like one of the biggest aha moments that I have. Um, there's, there was a client, or still a client, there's a client of ours. He 
um, is an absolute ninja with black practices, medical practices that are struggling financially. He's got a team. He knows the business better than any, any, anyone else. He takes it over. He fixes fixes it up, and then he buys the real estate and he has the has the asset, the business, and then sometimes he just sells the business. And he's getting cash flow from the real estate, right? So someone like that coming in and saying, you know, I don't want this money. I just want to put put it in Bitcoin now. <laughs> which was a conversation, I'm like, well, that's away from your unique ability. You're putting a buck into an ATM and it's spitting out a hundred right now. How many, how many dollars do you want to put in there? Well, as much as possible, right? So why would you go, want to go away from your, your unique ability? Focus, that's another thing. Can't be all over the place. Look at something, learn something, study something, one thing at a time. Uh, obviously protection, and we'll get into that a little bit more, which is part of any strategy, protecting the downside. There's many different ways to do that. Risk management, you know, there's there's a ton of different risks that we have to manage, right? Political is one of them, economic risk is one of them, market risk is another one, and then institutional risk. Be aware of all four different risks and how they can apply to what you're trying to do. Um, and then uh, dollar maximization is another point that we talk about. One dollar doing many different things at the same time. And that's part of a strategy. So do I put my money in one thing, and it is one job, or do I actually have it work really, really hard? I'm going to end off with efficiency on this one, and I put it at number seven, not because it's the seven most important thing, because I just want to spend some time to talk about it. This is the one lesson that I've learned too from uh, someone that I became friends with in the family offices. This was my one of my big aha moments a couple of years ago. Where um, he said, I MC, you want to come and just see what we do for some of these folks? Now, family office, if you don't know, it's almost like a wealth management company for a family taking care of the family's finances. You know, they can start at a hundred million dollar net worth. Some of them um, will take families for two hundred fifty million dollars. So they have all advisors under one roof. So they have their CPA, their, their insurance guy, their tech. everyone is under one roof because if your CPA is not talking to your um, asset protection guy, there's a lot of zeros behind that mistake. It's not just, oh, there's a couple of hundred bucks that we lost now. No, there's a lot. So they're under one roof. So I was jumping up and down just like a five-year-old. <laughs> so, or like a two-year-old that I have. He's also very excited about things. So, I, and I just wanted to be a fly on the wall. and just soak all of this up. Like, what did I do? And one of the things that was a very big aha moment for me is what most people do is they, they, they have their money right, and they take 10% of that money, whether they put it in a vehicle, in a retirement account, or whatever, but 10% of that money. And then they try to create a return on that money and multiply that money. 10%. That's, all, that's, remote, that's the strategy for the majority of folks, right? What these families are doing is they're looking at everything. They're looking at not just that 10%. That, that's actually in the order of importance. That's down on the totem pole for them. The order of importance is efficiency, holistic. Look, look at that. And he said, he said to me, MC, just think about it. We cut the, their taxes down 20%, but this family's generating now in their businesses and their investments and other position. What where, where are you going to get that return anyplace, anywhere, if you look at it over the next five years, next 10 years, next 20 years, next 30 years, and so forth? And I'm like, that's actually, yeah, I mean that that. That's what they're focused on. So they have a ton of accountants, they have a ton of lawyers looking at this stuff because they try to maximize that efficiency. So what they talk about efficiency is their savings and their asset positioning. So obviously the biggest threat to your wealth is taxes. And it's going to be an increasingly bigger threat as time goes on. I'm not going to jump into the national debt, <laughs> all of those things, because that, that could be an hour presentation. But there's a massive, massive train uh, down the road headed our way, and it's a, it's a tax train. Inflation is another one, the hidden, the hidden tax. Fees, right, is a big one, and then opportunity cost, because if you do one thing, you can't do another thing. So if you decide to do this, you can't do this. Can I save and invest simultaneously? You know, so there's a trade-off. What's the opportunity cost? What's the opportunity cost of putting money in my business and growing that? Or do I invest in something now that's providing cash flow? And then, of course, from income, we've already went through that, where the most efficient income is coming from. So if you know that the I quadrant is the least taxed out of all of them, 
that should be your main goal, should be that's where your income should be coming from, right, during the retirement. So you want to position yourself so that there is a close to tax-free retirement as possible. This, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but this is just an, a picture of a holistic vision if you want to take a, a, a picture of this where we have efficiency, risk management, control right at the bottom. Uh, estate planning, the family constitution, another um, tip that I picked up from family offices, where the family actually has um, a statement of purpose, so they write down everything from their core beliefs, what they stand for, um, how, how they operate, what are their principles, their values, um, and that ties into legacy, because we want to create stuff that other people find valuable, we want to keep creating, but we also want stuff to keep on living long beyond uh, our little life on this uh, spinning ball of dirt, right? Uh, and then we've got uh, protection, which is a big part of protecting your assets, protecting your income, and in the middle of the triangle, you know, we talk about wealth insurance, gold, silver, production, which is us, the asset liquidity, which we get to where you park your money. Uh, we talk about income, cash flow, growth, and then speculation is that big one. So I always say, you know, if you're going to buy that Bitcoin, do you have all the other things in place for it? And then you also have to determine when you when you set a blueprint for a strategy, where am I now, where do I want to go, and what are the levels, what are, what, are, what are the targets? I want to be financially free. What does that mean? Right? Great marketing piece. Probably a lot of people click will click on those Facebook ads, but what does it mean? What is financial freedom? So we talk about getting security first, you know, getting financial security in place, um, and that's your savings. That's some wealth insurance, so at least six to 12 months of savings to have that in place, cash. Um, and then having some gold and having some sort of financial independence is when your cash flow exceeds your expenses. So if you, your living expenses are $10,000 a month and you're making over $10,000 a month from your cash flow, from your investments, you're economically and financially independent. Financial freedom is another one um, where on top of that, we. We, we just times it by three right now, basically, or your independence number, because at that stage, money isn't, isn't or is a determining factor when you're making decisions about doing something. And then financial significance. You know, what, what does it look like when you get there? Now what? I've done this. Do I give back? Do I share my journey? Do I mentor other folks? Um, so that ties in. And then we build systems around it. Well, we have production, liquidity, which we'll get to, income growth, and then obviously our legacy. So this is a lot of what we talked about. And this is how you build a system within your overall strategy that's holistic. So as a business man or woman, what does businesses do? They multiply capital. We're in the business of multiplying capital. So how do we multiply capital? And we keep it very simple. You know, you've probably heard you've got to make money, you protect money, and you have to multiply. It's very simple. Very simple guy. We just call it cash creation, cash capture, and cash flow creation. So you first have to create some cash, then you have to protect that cash in a vault, right? Because there are storms, there will be storms, there will ever be storms. Um, you know, we're not in the prognostication business. It's a tough one. Um, but so we want to be ready for what's coming. Kenny McElroy, anyone familiar who he is? He's a rich dad advisor, a real estate, um, big, big real estate syndicator. He always talks about that the business creates the liquidity and the real estate creates the wealth. So I can, cannot say it better than that within the system. So to touch on this quickly, cash creation is your business, you. We don't have to go into that, developing your business and generating that cash machine. Cash capture, we talk about cash flow recovery which is how efficient are you? And um, I'll make available this book, uh, a cash flow order book that we did, um, which I'll share. There's a link that you can download it from. We had a client that we captured $1,000 a month. Just from working through that of things that you can do um, to free up cash in your own economy. Uh, cash flow automation, you know, now that you've freed up that cash, what are you gonna do? You know, Atlantic City on the weekends? You know, maybe Vegas? No. So, um, it ties into Parkinson's law, where once you've enjoyed a luxury, it becomes a necessity, right? So your expenses arise usually with your income. So we're trying to bat battle that. And then cash flow banking, which I'll touch on in a second. And then obviously cash flow creation is a passive investment. 
So I'm going to talk about cash flow banking quick, um, just because this is what we use basically for cash, cash flow protection. This is where we build our vault. And this is just something, again, being from South Africa, one, one of the things that I did and, and come over here is um, I played uh, sports. That's so how I ended up in the U.S. Um, so I played representative rugby. And the, my kind of like, I wouldn't say the secret, but just what I did as a playing competitive and representative sports was I was looked at what the best players were doing and I just modeled that. Same thing with this. We didn't create this. We didn't come up with this. We just copied and pasted what they did in family offices. So cash flow banking, you've probably heard of infinite banking, banking yourself, 770 account, the president's account, high cash value, life insurance, and more. Basically what it is, is it's a strategy that allows you to reclaim the banking function that utilizes the dividend paying whole life insurance policy with a mutual insurance card. So the whole life policy is structured for maximum early cash value from year one. Now, I probably said a four letter word, I don't know, you know, if you want to run away, <laughs> be my guest, use, that's usually the response that you get from that. And that's what you probably heard from these folks. So I just go back, you know, in my life, um, and we're all programmed this way. If this still happens to me, by the way, is when somebody tells me something, I just said that, 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 that it can't be. You know, and then I, I start, I step back and I say, there you go again, you know. Um, what if it was true? And then I start thinking a little bit differently about it. The reason why they say it, you know, for example, that maybe the, the whole idea calls the horrible one is again, it's product focused. The way that it's packaged and sold to the rest of the public, I agree with that, by the way. It's horrible. It's a horrible place to put your cash. But then you have a strategy where folks are using it that have a $250 million net worth, and they're using similar strategies. So, why do we talk about infinite banking in the banking system? Why would we want to imitate a bank? Well, last time I checked, that they're pretty, they're pretty big buildings. Um, and some of them create nice cash. Um, and I'm just talking about the traditional banking. We're not grouping in investment banking with this. <laughs> That's a different animal, completely different animal. But this is essentially the business model if you really want to break it down. And by the way, we're not going to talk about fractional reserve banking. You know, we're not going to talk about reserves. We're not going to talk about investment banking. This is just purely the deposit banking model back in the day. So, on the one side, you would have a depositor. We put money in a bank. We get something. We used to get something for it, a percentage. <laughs> now you get, you know, online bill pay, I guess, or something, something to that effect. Um, and then there's a lending side. So the bank gets his money from the depositors, and then he lends it and borrows it out to folks that need car loans, uh, real estate loans, school loans, business loans, or for whatever that fact. So. How does this model work? So let's just say you put $10,000 in a bank. You are the depositor and the bank pays you 1%. You get 100 bucks for it. But at the same time, they take that $10,000 and maybe give it to a small business and they charge them 10%. And people would say, that's a pretty good deal. It's a spread of 9%. It's really, really good. But if you think about it, the only money that the bank had in this transaction was the 100 bucks that they paid out on interest. So they return on that, this, this very basic, simple model that made a $900 profit, which is 900%. So that's just kind of very, very, uh, like I said, very standard and basic. But I just wanted to share this because this is what folks are doing in their own economy, using different assets and integrating it, not just the product, a whole strategy. You can do a similar model in your own, in your own economy, and we do. Um, we do do the same thing. So why do, why do we use that chassis? You know, infinite banking, this insurance carrier that's a mutual insurance company. They've been around since the mid-1800s. Uh, they've weathered the storms. They're not in the, the casino. They're completely out, outside of Wall Street. Because you have full use and control over your money. There's also a lot of flexibility. How you fund it, how you take your money out of it. There's immediate access and liquidity through policy loans, which I'll get to in a second. There's guarantees on principle and growth, right? So your money's guaranteed and there's growth in it. I like guarantees, you know? Um, the wealthy blueprint that I, that I copied, those folks like guarantees as well. Dividends, as a shareholder in the company, you get a di dividend. It's not guaranteed, but some of them have paid them since 1847. There's tax, tax deferred growth and untaxed distribution, so it's a tax-free bucket. This permanent, this permanent insurance product. 
So if you know that there's a tax strain coming down the line in 10, 15, and 20 years, would you want tax-free income then, or would you want to wait and figure out if you're going to pay taxes or not, or what the tax rates are going to be, who's going to be president, who's going to be in Congress, all that stuff, right? The first thing that, that I do with sports, when I coach it um, as well, is you want to limit and reduce the impact of unknown variables, or variables that you're aware of. You're aware of taxes. There's other ones that you might not be aware of. So that's where you're, you know, double teaming, putting two guys to play defense on another guy to control that, that known variable. And then also plan for the unknown variables when you're working out a game plan. Same thing with money. So down the line, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, what does taxes look like? Do you guys want to pay taxes in it? I definitely, at that stage, I definitely don't. Um, there's uh, no contribution and distribution limits. So this is not, they'll underwrite you for whatever your net worth is. So that's the only thing that might, might come into play, income and net worth. Otherwise, there's no, there's no legal uh, limit. It's a private contract, and asset protection in some states, flexibility in funding. Like I said, access payback, funding continuation if you have a disability. Um, that could be worked into a contract, so if something happens, for example, that I can do what I do, <laughs> which is talking quite a lot. But if that would happen, then that could be taken care of. There's a death benefit multiple of an account value. Income tax free to beneficiaries. That's very nice of transferring wealth through uh, and creating a legacy. So that's why they do it. If this is a little bit, because I know you guys have been drinking from a water fountain or a water hose, right? And I'm just adding to that. Mm -hmm. Think about the strategy of how to collateralize assets, because this is what the ultra wealthy do dollar maximization, one dollar to many, many different jobs simultaneously. And I broke this down very, very basic. So, and there's a couple of ways that you can do this. For this, I said a CD. So in the 80s, and I, I think it was the 70s, that. right? Um, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the 70s and the 80s, banks would buy almost double digits interest on CDs, right? Apparently that happened, it was, it was, it was pretty good. So all you had to do is put $100,000 in a bank account and a CD in the bank, let's just say, by 10% on it. So someone would go to the bank and do that. That same person would go back to the banker and say, Mr. Banker, uh, I have $100,000 in a CD here. Can you give me a loan that's secured by that CD? What's the banker going to tell you? They're in the business of lending money, and they've got collateral. So they would say, yeah, you can do that. I'll give you 90% of the money that you put in at a loan, and let's just sell it to you at 8%, right? And then someone would take that loan then and invest in, in this case, real estate at 15% cash on cash. And the profits from the real estate pay back the loan that they have um, and paying that loan down. That's how you collateralize assets. So you have money in a CD growing, okay? Guaranteed, contractually guaranteed. You have a loan, which is efficient if you negotiate it properly. And you use that and leverage that to buy real estate, another asset now, that generates cash flow that pays down the loan. So all of a sudden, I'm not even touching on the real estate, your money is doing many different things simultaneously. When I look at strategies like this, there's quite a number of them. Asset-based lending is one of them, just off the top, top of my head. You can, if you have a stock portfolio and certain, um, certain stocks, you can get a, a line of credit or a loan secured by that stocks. I'm not very comfortable doing that because you, I cannot control the stocks. Uh, HELOC strategy is the same thing. Essentially, you're collateralizing your house, taking out a HELOC, and doing the same thing. I just, you know, I, I, I just don't like the fact that I can control the equity in my house, right? And there's some provisions in HELOC that doesn't give you the necessary the flexibility. So essentially, it's the same kind of stuff like this. You're just using an insurance, insurance contract for all the other different things. Um, if I can go back, all of these that I listed uh, in there. So this is what it looks like. I like pictures. So you put your money into this vehicle. This is where you keep it. This is where you position it because of the dividends, the, the tax free growth, the guarantees. You leverage it to buy the investment, and the cash flow pays the policy along that because you collateralize the cash that you put inside this policy. So we're in the business of multiplying capital, and again, back to the model that we do. We create cash. We capture it through protection, putting it in that vault, and then we leverage it to create a cash flow uh, through passive investments. 
So this is just a quick way that we've done it with, with real estate. We, just, we have a client that they've purchased five properties now in two years just doing the exact same thing I'm showing you. So they would, they would set up their policy, they would leverage the money as a down payment for the policy because they do it through turnkey real estate. Um, and then they would get the mortgage for the property, the cash flow pays back the policy loan, and when the cash, flow, the cash value becomes available again as they're funding premiums, they just do it again. Rinse, repeat. And you can do this over and over and over. This is why it's called infinite banking. So this is the combination between the two, and I'll just go through this because I just my ideas, you know, I, or my my concept uh, set for today's discussion is I just want to give you the big picture and leave some ideas with you that there's different ways of doing things. This doesn't have to be your way. I just want you to, to think about your thinking, as Dan Sullivan would say. Life insurance, and for instance, the real estate that we do, there's cash flow both, there's liquidity in both, there's tax advantages. You have a tax-free bucket that you that you can basically set up a tax-free retirement from it for you, and then you have tax advantages in the real estate. Um, equity build-up, appreciation, equity also in the, in the real estate should also be in there, but we have controlled leverage and inflation and hedge involved. So just a quick, again, I don't want to drill down in the weeds because it could get muddy, especially this late in the afternoon, but just to give you an example of why someone would do this is, you know, a 40-year-old male, God probably around about my age, you know, he has a passive income goal of $360,000 a year because that's what he's trying to replace. He wants to do it through a real estate syndication where he figured conservative get 8%. He could do it. He's saving and investing about 200 grand a year. So how do we position that 200 grand better per year? This is, well, first before we get there, I'm getting ahead of myself, but without the insurance portion and without reinvesting because I didn't want to muddy it. So at the bottom, we did not invest yearly cash flows because that will reduce the time, but if you did not do that, because I just wanted to get a clear picture for you, there's 22 and a half years, he will have 4.5 million deployed, which should get him his passive income goal of $360,000 per year. So again, if he reinvested the cash flows, just on the top of my head, it's probably gonna be around 10 to 14 years, right? It's gonna compress the time that he gets to do this. But my point was, I just wanted to break it clean, because on the other slide, I did the same thing we took the 200,000 first, we funded cash flow banking, it's protected, it's guaranteed. In 20 years, you would have deployed the $4.5 million. You hit your goal of $360,000 per year, you achieve that, but there's a bonus because you ran it through the vault first, which captures the cash, it guarantees. There's approximately $1.4 million tax free with a debt benefit and liquidity transfer to your respect. I kind of like that. That's nice for me. So, can you do it without it? Absolutely. My, 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 as I said, my goal was just to show you a couple of different things. Can you do it in your business? Absolutely. This is where a lot of our business clients keep their money. So even folks that run, run campaigns uh, online, so you run a Facebook campaign, for example, let's just say you put $100,000 in there, uh, let's just say it costs you 10 bucks uh, per acquisition uh, to, to get someone, you get 10,000 leads from that, you close 10% of it's 1,000 people. What if you sold? Um, what if you sold that ticket item for two thousand dollars, and you close ten percent of those leads? Right, it's two hundred thousand dollars that you just turned that hundred into. So the business owner, why is he going to give his money to a financial advisor that's going to get him eight percent in the stock market? It would make sense, but that's why certain folks are stuck in the S, not going to the B and the I. Another thing that I call this is the end asset again. We have, there's always choices, and there's opportunity costs of doing one thing versus another thing. So I like to have my cake and eat it too. Um, and the folks that I copied the strategy from, they definitely have to have it too. So can you save and invest at the same time? It's possible. Uh, as a bonus, I just wanted to show you something else. Uh, this is just a little bit of a bonus. I figured if we had time, I'll share it. Another strategy of something that how do you... How do guys like Buffett, what are some of the things that they're doing then? They know that there's a, you know, there's a crash probably around the corner. You know, we're not, again, we're not in the crystal ball business. It's a very, very uh, uh, unprofitable business, that one. But you know that at the top of the market cycle, how do you start protecting, how do you start taking things off the table? So one of the things that big banks actually do, besides the cash flow banking strategy that I just told you, that's by, by the way, with the majority of the safe capital tier one in big banks, 
And even some investment banks have their money in corporations such as GE, Disney, they use the same thing on their employees, right? Um, for example, Jeffrey Immelt, if you caught, caught that when he walked away from GE, had a very nice package in the life insurance. And a life insurance vehicle, which will just, most people won't even look at that. You look at Jim Harbaugh, that is the head football coach at the University of Michigan. So his agent or, uh, negotiated a deal with an advisor too through life insurance. Same thing, guarantees. This is a different vehicle, so life settlements is another way that these guys, like banking and financial institutions, insurance companies, and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, this is one of their biggest secrets of where they park their cash, and I'll tell you why. Because they can actually buy their equity in investments. How nice would that be to invest in something and you know you buy your equity in it, and you know that it's going to pay out at some stage, you know, uh, at a certain level. That's what they do. They like certainty and they like things that are guaranteed. So life settlements is basically a pool of life insurance policies from folks. So why would somebody sell a life insurance policy? Why would somebody buy it? Is it a little bit shady? Is it unethical? It's actually legal in the United States and there's actually benefits to both the buyer and both the seller. There are some folks that would have a policy, maybe um, Somebody, somebody um, unfortunately becomes ill, but they just went through 2007 and 2008, so they lost all the equity in their house, and they lost everything in the market, so what do they do? Are they out on the street? No, they still have a life insurance policy with some equity, but they had a huge death benefit. So they can get up to four to five times of the cash value of that policy and sell it to an institution or a fund that would buy it. So well, how does that play out? The person selling it, now has access to capital because they lost everything, right? Um, there's actually some famous person that actually did it. it was, I think it was Johnny Carson's sidekick. Is that Ed McMahon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, so he was he was actually in the news with something like that. But anyway, so it works out. So he could hold on to some of the assets for his loved ones off the boss, and then the investors that put up the cash for it, they buy their equity. So it's a win-win. So I mentioned the seller receives four to five times their cash, the buyers purchase their equity, and the policy is mature in five to seven years. So Gates and Buffett both are big in this, Buffett especially. So what would that look like? And I've made the numbers a little bit smaller just so that it's not completely crazy. But let's just say, for example, that you know the death benefit that someone would pay out is $160,000 and they invest it. You know, hundred thousand dollars. So obviously they, they bought their equity, right? So if the policy matures in year one, their return is sixty percent. If the returns in year two, it's thirty, you know, three, twenty, fifteen, twelve, and ten. So on average, these folks get ten to twelve percent basically on the player. So it has guarantees for them, it's completely out of the markets, it's not correlated. The only thing that it's correlated to is forex. It's in US dollars, right? But it's not in real estate, it's not in stocks, it's not in Bonds, mutual funds, none of that stuff. So it's just something that I just wanted to, to throw at you guys so that you know that there's there's different ways of doing different things. Can you combine this with cash flow banking? Absolutely. We have folks that do that too. They fund their cash flow banking policy, um, and it's actually <laughs> it's actually folks that work work in very risky environments, meaning when they're either traders or they're on Wall Street already, or they're in the medical field where you know, I get a phone call from someone and say, MC, I just don't want to worry about my Apple stock when I'm about to step into the open heart surgery. So that's not nice. I like to focus on the, on the person that I'm trying to help. So what would they do? They would put money in a vault, cash flow banking, they would leverage it, they would put it into something like this. It's guaranteed on both sides and they know regardless of what happens in the stock market and the economy, they have guarantees built into their plan. So they don't lie awake at night thinking about trade wars or equity markets or who's winning the next midterm election or who's in, in, in the White House, they don't care because they've invested in a position themselves as part of a strategy so that it doesn't affect them. So I started this presentation with the one thing, the surprisingly simple truth beyond extraordinary financial results. I tweaked it a little bit, of course. So and it's a powerful strategy. So please, the one thing is when you listen to all these things and you listen to different podcasts and you have um, different ideas, think about your strategy. Think about your unique ability, your skill set, your value, where this all fits in for you. 
um, and how it can fit in for you. And if it doesn't, if there's some, you know, if there's something that you can do better or tweak better, or maybe use a similar strategy that I just showed you, but in different assets. So, like I said, I have listeners all over the world. This is only for Canadians and the U.S. folks that can actually do cash flow banking. But I've had like really, really good responses uh, from folks that said they listened to one or two of our episodes that we talk about this, and they figured out a way to maximize their they maximize their um, money as well, dollar maximization within their strategy. So they didn't necessarily use that vehicle, they just used the core principles. So that, that, that's my goal for today. So uh, for more information, this is the, the, my firm that does it, produces wealth for clients in 45 states, hopefully 15 in the next couple of months. We just added a Y, which is kind of nice. But um, that's, that's the website to check it out. And then your own banking system is a webinar and a course. There's a book in there too. Um, if you guys are interested in more information, we put out a ton of content just to educate folks. Because our mission is to liberate folks from the rat race. That's what we're very passionate about. So we put out three podcasts a week. We put out a ton of stuff on YouTube. There's a ton of webinars and ebooks and so forth. Um, thank you so much for having me. I will take a couple of questions uh, if you guys have any, any questions. Can you go to back here? Oh, yeah. Thank you. There you go. Sorry. One more. Oh, one more back. One more. Oh, one more back. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So the vault, that is your full length Yes. You had mentioned these, like, and I know they have to hide years ago. Yes. Yeah, so what I was trying to show there is just a, a, uh, when you collateralize assets. So people used to do that in the 80s because they were they had these high interest rates, right? And then people also do this with ELOPs. They do it with a strategy called asset-based lending, where you can actually borrow against the stock portfolio. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, it didn't have, you know, some of the guarantees, obviously, in the stock portfolio for me, and the ELOP with the equity and then the tax-free growth. Um, you know, and I always say like equity is great in the home, but you can't eat it. It doesn't feed you. It doesn't. It doesn't make you cash flow. So I was looking at something like that, and then this one checked a lot of the boxes, um, and that's part of the. By the way, and I didn't say this, and maybe I uh, didn't put this in, but that's part of the financial security. So when you build something, for me personally, when I set this up, several policies, that's if there's any shakeup in, in the business world. If there's any shakeup in investments, a couple of buildings that I'm invested in burned to the ground, then I know that there's a tax free income coming from those policies. And while that's building up, I can access it at the meantime, I'm restricted. Um, it's a one sheeter that you fill out and then wire you the money or send you a check. So it's not like a 401k loan or something like that. And do you recommend, sorry, last yeah. one, like one, like you're going to get some vault, your whole life policy and not taking a Yes, and there's a reason why we do multiples. Um, and again, using myself as the guinea pig, because it's structured, it's structured not for death benefit. So a lot of folks just look at the death benefit, but I actually like the life part of the life insurance, because I want to use it while I'm alive. So it's structured uh, so that you have the maximum cash for the death benefit that you basically need under IRS regulations. So what does that mean? 70% of the money that you put into a cash flow banking policy should be available as cash value. So if you put $100,000 in in your first year, you should have close to 70. I know it's different for everyone, different underwriting, age, all that stuff. But you should almost have about 70,000 in there just in cash value. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think you answered my question. What you're suggesting is funding the policy in one shot, not as a uh, no. So what, 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 I'm, what I was suggesting is instead of um, the question was, do you add multiple policies? And I said, yes. So you keep funding premiums for all of them every year. They could be paid up in as little as seven years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Is it possible to pay it up in one year? No. So that's where the IRS came in in the 80s for the first time and dove into uh, life insurance because there used to be a single premium payment. And they now call it a modified endowment contract, which it loses all of its tax favorability. 
They basically, basically tax it just like a CD at that stage. So that's, that's why you have to structure it in a certain way that it's maximum cash value, but you still have a death benefit. So you stay into it and you fund it over a number of years. So to, to tie into that, um, we have clients from different ages all over the place, right? So someone would say, would this work for anyone? Everyone has a different situation. You can look at it, but if someone's young, or someone is in their 30s or 40s, their prime earning years or 50s, or someone's getting ready for their retirement, there's different strategies. Because when you're young, you have a lot of time, but you don't have a lot of resources yet. Um, when you're in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, you're starting to, now you're hitting your prime income earning years. And then, of course, then you hit your retirement years. There's different strategies and different ways to set it up. Uh, another thing about la laddering policies is at a certain point, a company will say, you know, they can only underwrite a certain amount of money. But what happens if your income increases significantly? I'll give you a quick example because I know we're almost done, but if a 30-year-old person that's a breadwinner in a family, let's just say there's two children, two young children, the person's making $100,000 per year, the insurance company's going to go, probably 3.54 million is what they will underwrite them for because that's their human life value, 100,000 times of, you know, the 40 years. But what if that person then in the five years has now doubled his income, he's making $200,000 a year? Well, then you can go back and you can underwrite and add another policy, basically. That's efficient structure. Any other questions? All right, you guys have been great. Thank you very much. today but the smartest ones are the ones that are still here the people that actually stuck it out stayed the whole time and learned the most so you'll be making a lot more than those people who left at lunchtime I promise you. When's so the thanks next again one? for coming I appreciate it have a great day Bye.